I'm very pleased to have football legend Matt Letissier here with me today, and um, I'm I'm very chuffed to be able to speak to you. And Thank you, mate. Lovely to be here. To introduce Matt, if you're not familiar with him already, um, he's made about 500 appearances, I think probably more, isn't it, for Southampton Football Club, scoring over 200 goals, which makes you the club's top all-time goal scorer. Uh, only in the Premier League. In the Premier League. Um <laughs> Nick and Shannon you... is the top goal scorer of all time for Southampton. Okay. And um, <laughs> you also played for England, although I would say far too little. Thank you. I'd say the same. <laughs> and um, you're also known for your, your technical football skills. And I think that's um, something that everyone knows you for. And mm. I think I would be very remiss not to mention the fact that you only missed one out of 47 penalties taken while you're at Southampton, which is incredibly impressive and i know we have some americans that might not know much about football <laughs> or as you call it soccer but that is very very good <laughs> thank you very much um and just a, on a, a more personal note my personal favorite goal of yours is um october 1993 against newcastle where you you caught it almost on the the, the studs flicked of your over boot. my own head yeah flicked it over your head and then yeah. over the defender and then right Two past defenders. the goalkeeper i i spent <laughs> When, when I was younger, when I was a, a lad, I spent hours and hours with my mates trying to recreate Did that. Did you really? Wow. <laughs> I was not, was not able to do it. I don't it. think even I could recreate it, so I don't know <laughs> what chance you had. <laughs> I, I wasn't nearly as good, not even close. I played for the school football team and that was about it. Okay. But um, following your exit from professional football, um, you went on in 2002 to become a presenter. I think it was in 2004 for Sky Sports Soccer Saturday. And I, I saw you quite a lot on that as well. Okay. So it, is, it has been a pleasure. Thank you very much. So moving on to whether you were cancelled. And I, I've collected some stories from um, recent times looking at exactly that. And yep. this one is from the Daily Star, which obviously is not a, an outlet I'm a fan of. But <laughs> here it is. Uh, Matt Letitia and Patrice Evra cut from Premier, Premier League uh, Hall of Fame shortlist after outbursts. And I'm just going to read a little bit from the body of text just so you get the idea of what it's talking about. So it says, This year's shortlist has been reduced to just uh, 15, 10 less than last year, as only three years of yesteryear will be, um, three stars, sorry, of yesteryear will be inducted based on a fan vote rather than six previously. Teddy Sheringham, Edwin van der Sar, Robin van Persie, and uh, Rudd van Nistelrooy have all been axed. All good players, as far as I'm aware. Mm. So. What's your um, perspective on this? Uh, it, it's interesting. If you go back to the headline um, uh, of the piece uh, where it says, uh, Matt Sissi and Patrick's ever a cut from Prem Hall of Fame shortlist after outburst, out, outburst. That reading that uh, headline kind of says, oh, these two have been cut from the Hall of Fame because of what they did and what they said. But if you read the actual story, there's six players there that were, were dropped from the shortlist. Um, yet they chose to uh, pick on me and Patrice mm. uh, and barely mentioned the other four that none of the, none of the other four did anything wrong, uh, but they're intimating that me and Patrice are out because of what we said. Um, so very misleading headline, uh, as is the way with uh, these publications. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it's um, something that they've obviously done on purpose to make mm -hmm. people think that me and Patrice are really bad people. Yeah, so you, it's pretty much that they're misrepresenting the situation. Very much so, uh, okay. as is their want, as is what they normally do. <laughs> There's going to be a lot of that, unfortunately. So sorry to <laughs> bring no you problem. in. And, it's it, nice to be able to put the record straight yeah. and try to explain to people uh, exactly what these uh, publications are doing when they write these headlines. Mm -hmm. So this next one is... Uh, titled Stratford Town Cancel Sporting Event with Southampton legend Matt Letissia after outrage from fans. And I'm just going to read a little bit saying here that bosses at Stratford Town FC have cancelled their sporting evening with former professional footballer Matt Letissia as they do not wish to create division within the community or within the football club. And I mean, I, I don't really understand a lot of the time when these these higher ups say these sorts of things there isn't nearly the level of outrage that um, media publications seem to so it's interesting so me. yes the, the uh, Stratford Town booked me to do a dinner the dinner sold out within 24 hours and then on their social media um, it was probably four or five fans 
had said that you know they weren't happy that I was there and that the the club were giving me a platform to speak, even though my after dinner speeches are all about my football career and my career at Sky. I, I don't touch on uh, any controversial issues from the I mean, last few years. It'd be very strange if you went to a football related evening yeah. and then you started talking about <laughs> yeah, exactly. know, the pandemic or something. So it was a bit bizarre. So the interesting thing is that, yes, they had, I think it was about four or five people complained. Um, and on the basis of that, Stratford decided they didn't want to create division within the community. Uh, so they cancelled it. And upon cancelling it, they then had dozens of people on their social media actually having a go at the football club for cancelling me. So they bowed to a very small minority of people mm -hmm. uh, when the vast majority of people, and as you could see, it was obviously quite popular because it sold out within 24 hours, uh, and they decided that, uh, that they were going to cancel it. And by cancelling it, they actually created more division within the community than they would have done <laughs> had they just let the event go it's, ahead. It's the case almost always, isn't it? Whenever these sorts of things go on, the, the, the whole reasoning for it doesn't make any sense when you look it at it in no hindsight, sense. because normally no they sense. cause far more problems, as you say, than would have existed beforehand. Yep, and this is what happens when you bow down to a uh, gobby minority. Yeah, and it, it's always one direction as well, isn't it? In the, Yep. It, it comes from a very... Um, select group of people from a very select part of the political spectrum and Indeed. quite often the concerns of other people get uh pushed to the side they're yeah. not important in it's normally the be kind movement it's yeah the, it's those guys the people that are, that are kind but um are, are more everyone. than happy to uh, ruin people's lives absolutely can't let him earn a living you know can't let him pay his mortgage and I, feed his family the, the rationale behind it i just can't get my head around because if you're thinking about it from a purely practical standpoint persecuting people, potentially ruining their career, defaming their reputation. That's not going to win them round. It's going to make them double down, isn't it? Absolutely, it will. Yep. And, so, uh, yep. Big problems in society at the moment with stuff like that. Moving on to this one here. This is from May 2022. And this is um, Jersey Bull cancel appearance after fan backlash. Mm -hmm. Of course, um, Americans will recognise that name because that is one of your own teams. So... Uh, the, the so the Jersey Bulls football team in the Channel Island of oh, Jersey. That Jersey. Oh, yeah. thank you for correcting me. Yeah. Sorry, I'm fake news there. <laughs> so yes, this is the That's embarrassing. So bear in mind, I grew up um, on Guernsey, mm -hmm. the other Channel Island, which is Jersey's biggest rivals. You know, a lot of uh, uh, rivalry there in the sporting context between the two islands. So I was asked to go and speak at the Jersey Bulls end of season uh, awards dinner. Uh, and again, um, that headline. If you can, if you can just go down to that headline again, it's interesting. Jersey Bulls cancel the beams after fan backlash. Now that is completely fake news. Jersey Bulls cancelled my appearance because ITV in Jersey had gone to the Jersey Bulls and said, basically, we are going to cover this event and we're going to treat it as a controversial event because you've got Matt Letizia speaking there. This had nothing to do with any fan backlash. So once again, not for the first time, funny enough, is the BBC uh, promoting a completely wrong story. Absolutely. They've never been known to do that before, Absolutely they? disgusting. Oh. It was uh, ITB um, that got me cancelled because they threatened the Jersey Bulls that they were going to turn this into a controversial uh, function uh, and they were going to uh, report on it as such. And so uh, Jersey Bulls um, bowed down to ITB. Nothing to do with any fan backlash whatsoever. That's really interesting. I I didn't know about that. And, and uh, uh, yeah, I mean... So they're effectively just making things up or making... BBC have um, made that up, fan mm -hmm. backlash. There was no fan backlash. It was all to do with ITB Jersey, who for some reason didn't want me appearing there. One can only assume because of your your political views. I would imagine. Indeed, of course, the mainstream media um, will uh, not tolerate me in any way, shape, or form. I spent fifteen years, well, nearly twenty years, working uh, on Sky Sports, talking about sport. Uh, and the minute that I spoke up against what was going on in our country, the minute I spoke up against the 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 government narrative, um, the minute I spoke up against Black Lives Matter, uh, I was 
sacked from my job. Um, and at the time, um, I spoke to my agent uh, and when I, I told him the news and he was like, don't worry, we should, we'll find somewhere else for you. We get, we get you. And I said to him on that day, I said, I will not be employed again by the mainstream media. I can guarantee you that now. Well, they, they, and three years later, I'm not wrong. They effectively have blacklists. Absolutely. From what I've, I've heard from behind the scenes, they, they have lists of uh, physical lists sometimes of people that they're just like, under no circumstances can we have this person on the show. And it's not that they're even necessarily fringe figures that are promoting so called dangerous ideas. <laughs> uh, it, it's more that they disagree with them and don't want to. They, they can't a have any debate. They yeah, can't. Exactly. They can't. They don't want to debate. They just want their narrative to be uh, upheld at all times by all mm -hmm. people. Um, uh, and un unfortunately, you know, it, and it, it's not just it's not just the uh, television either. You know, I was a regular contributor to Talksport. Um, you know, whenever anything happened, Southampton football club wise, uh, I was the first person they would ring and say, "Could you come on for an interview?" Which I did, free of charge. Um, probably 99% of the time uh, when I went into the studio uh, on occasions uh, I did get paid for that but any of the phone interviews I did never charge them for um, and from that moment onwards uh, Talk Sport uh, will no longer ring me uh, anything to do with Southampton I did have uh, once about uh, six months ago I think there was a segment they wanted to do on penalties and they rang me and asked me if I'd do it I said, oh, that's interesting. I said, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll do that. Uh, this could be fun. Uh, and do you know what they did? They, they'd they never done this before to me. They pre-recorded the interview. Oh, huh. I, I know I why wonder, they've done that. Yeah. I wonder why they did that. <laughs> First time ever they invited me on and pre-recorded the interview just in case I went off track and started <laughs> speaking about stuff they didn't want to know about. Interesting, isn't it? I, I don't really understand the necessity for that because you've got a, a track record of many, many years talking purely about football mm. in football related programs. So what you're going to all of a sudden, <laughs> all of a sudden I'm just going to go off piste and start talking <laughs> about the government and their response to all the nonsense of the last three years. It, 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 I, I struggle to get my head around it because it seems so simple. It's a weird to my world. Mind, yeah. It's a weird world. So, I think uh, this is one that a lot of people who are watching this segment are probably keen to see, and it is um, this one from The Mirror. Um, Matt Letitia suggests Sky Sports sacked him for views, but insists, I'm not a nutter. Um, interesting that they went with that quote above any other in the headline, because it kind of implies that if you're having to deny it, then there must be something to it. Is of course, that's what they do. Mm. I, I don't even remember saying the words, uh, I'm not a nutter. Uh, it seems I, I'm not a stupid human being. <laughs> I think is uh, the the actual quote. Um, uh, I don't really use the word yeah. nutter at all. Um, it's so once so again, they've changed the language in the title the to make it look of even worse. Yeah. Of course they do. Mm -hmm. uh, they also call you a conspiracy theorist in the first line as well, which is yep. a bit absurd. Yep, that's what they do. They throw that word because if you if you call mm -hmm. somebody that, that must mean that you know they're a bit nutty and uh, you know and that really means that they don't have to debate anything with that person. They don't have to mm -hmm. speak to him because yeah, I can't speak to him. He's a conspiracy theorist. Well, actually, if you if you sit down and look at what I've been saying over the last few years, um, uh, a lot of the stuff that, that I spoke about three years ago actually kind of ended up happening and trying to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and so well, I, think I, I actually got to the point now where being called a conspiracy theorist is actually a compliment because they've got a lot more right in the last few years than what the mainstream media have and, and mm -hmm. certainly the certainly daily mirror and the, the daily star the covid and, and pandemic stuff that's aged quite well hasn't it um i i'd like to think so but i'm not one to say i told you so <laughs> but I, one thing about the, the whole conspiracy theory thing is that more often than not it's just a very uncharitable reading because of course there are conspiracy theories that the media doesn't label conspiracy theories like the, the russia gate thing in the united states Absolutely. is a great Hunt, example Hunter of biden's that. laptop exactly well, well the, the there's a conspiracy intelligence theory. Oh, agencies no, told twitter to cover it up yeah we have it explicitly we know it happened and i was saying you know that the twitter 
is being censored from behind the scenes. I didn't necessarily know for certain whether it is American intelligence agencies doing it, but it turned out it was. It was. You know, I mean, it's, it's funny how incredible. these things mysteriously become true down the line, isn't it? But it's been a, a tactic used for many, many years of just throwing that conspiracy theory label at somebody to try to discredit them, and it means you don't have to mm -hmm. debate them and talk about what they're, what they're talking about. And, um, yeah, that's just a, a mm -hmm. tactic of the, the mainstream media. So this, this article here, it goes on to talk about the pandemic-related stuff, and it, it seems to imply that you were um, forced to retire, I think is that the, the right way of putting it? Um, or... From my ambassadorial role at Southampton? Um, is that what you, we're talking about? No, um, from Sky Sports. Um, I was forced to retire? I don't know. Um, I don't know what be <laughs> the best way to, to put it. Oh, so um, I was sacked from Sky Sports. Okay. Um, quite frankly, there's no other way of putting it. Mm -hmm. um, um, I had seven months left on my contract. I heard loads of people going, oh, no, his contract was up and they just didn't renew it, mm -hmm. which, uh, you know, was absolute bs mm -hmm. uh i had seven months left on my contract and they told us with mm -hmm. a week before the season started by the way uh so not really gave the three of us any chance to um find other work anywhere um uh, and we were told in the little week of the season start that we were no longer needed uh, the, mm -hmm. that the um show was going in a different direction is the words that they used That's on the a Zoom euphemism call. isn't it it's <laughs> a very polite way of saying yeah that you're sacked yeah uh, oh, uh, so um yeah so at that point i i just asked them mm -hmm. if it was anything to do with my uh stuff that i was posting on social media uh to which the reply was um well you know we have to uh, take into account the reputation of our company um and so i just asked them well you didn't seem that bothered about the reputation of your company when you re-employed jamie carragher after he we spat be, at a uh, young girl We'll be talking about, we talking that, about that one later. Yeah. Okay, so that um, was all part of that. <laughs> but this seems to imply that it was your um, views on the, the pandemic in particular that were a sticking point. And of course, it is impossible for them to know that. But it, did you give them any reason to believe that that might be the case? Do you think that's a, a fair assessment or is it just your, your views more generally? Um, I, I think... Probably my views are, it was probably having to do with my views on the on the pandemic, but also to do with my views on specifically the football clubs, the way they behaved mm -hmm. um, during the uh, time when they were trying to restart the season uh, and there was stuff that was going on with the testing and everything and, and some clubs coming out and saying, yes, that's our players that are testing positive or um, and all those. There, there were certain football clubs that were, would have been very happy if the season had not started again, let's put it that way, and that the season was just devoid and you start the next season with the same 20 teams in the Premier League. Um, and so, yeah, the, the teams that were kind of angling towards trying to get the season cancelled were the ones that were uh, towards the bottom end of the division uh, who could find <laughs> possibly fall out and lose a lot of money um, by getting relegated from the Premier League. And I pointed that out in a, in a tweet and, um, that upset one of the chief executives at one of the clubs involved. Um, I also uh, refused to wear the Black Lives Matter badge, um, uh, and I was the uh, kind of first person on Sky to kick up a bit of a stink about it. wasn't happy about it. But rightly uh, so, though, in in my opinion, I think in hindsight, um, given what's coming out come out about well, that yeah, organisation, I think all I'm of the money, pretty yeah, I'm pretty confident and pretty uh, happy in my stance that I took back then. Mm -hmm. um, it also, I think it's a fair thing to say that what does it have to do with football as well? I mean, there yeah. there are already avenues for politics. Yes. Why absolutely. does it have to ruin something that is people's escape from? The, yeah. The, you know, when I get a lot of people going, oh, well, it's because, he, you know, he's an anti-vaxxer. He got sacked at Sky. And I was like, well, actually, this is August 2020. Vaccines hadn't even come out yet. <laughs> so you can put that one to bed, mate. It's just mm. some of the stuff's just crazy that gets said about you. But um, the mirror here was was referring to these things as conspiracy theories, and then you go to an outlet like the, the Telegraph around the similar sort of time, and there's a very different uh, tone being taken here. Of course, this is just the, the views of one of their contributors, but not the whole paper, but they mm -hmm. say, bravo to the lockdown sceptics who were smeared and dismissed for daring to defend freedom, which I think is a fair thing to say, in my opinion. 
is certainly what I was trying to do throughout the pandemic. But yeah. it's very interesting now that um, we've come out the other side and there are lots of questions being asked about these sorts of things that all of a sudden we're defending freedom rather than you know, and being a conspiracy theorist and exactly, causing yeah. chaos. Yeah, I, and I think that's a, that was always my my issue was about uh, defending freedoms. I could see the route that we were going down um, and uh, I didn't like what I was seeing. I could see ulterior motives behind uh, what mm. was coming in um, and they were using the pandemic as an excuse to bring in uh, some legislation that they would in normal times have not a zero zero chance of bringing in all this stuff Even unless the, they'd have a uh, an emergency to do it. Even in a, a wartime situation, some of the legislation that they passed like, was even unprecedented like in World War Two. So <laughs> to, to justify it and say it's necessary, given that the situation and with the benefit of hindsight is absurd. It's yeah, it is absurd. I mean, the, they knew very early on just um, how dangerous uh, this virus was. They they had data um, from the Diamond Princess cruise ship very early on. Uh, I think Chris Whitty even admitted on live on television very early on that you know this is only uh, going to affect the either very elderly people or the immuno immunocompromised. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, and he also said that masks didn't work early on, and then f changed his mind on that one when obviously somebody told <laughs> Actually him covered that's recently not the right a, thing to um, do. A, a large um, systematic review of the research <laughs> that found that there are actually lots of negative health consequences to wearing a mask over I mean, the long term. Any uh, any sensible, rational human being, you'd have to be a scientist to actually understand <laughs> that covering your mouth for hours upon hours a day and breathing in your your own exhaled breath is not going to be particularly healthy for you. I'm no scientist, but common sense tells me <laughs> that ain't good for you. Also, the, the fact that it's just unpleasant when you actually do it as well. You, there's a reason that it feels unpleasant. Absolutely. It's because it's not healthy for you. It, absolutely. And mm -hmm. it's uh, it was it was another, for me, uh, that was another way of just ke mm -hmm. keeping on instilling the fear into population and a, and a reminder that you should be fearful. I, the, the study I was referring to also found that actually wearing a mask created the perfect environment for viral mutation. Yeah. So <laughs> Funny that. <laughs> may have actually made things worse. But yep. um, this next story here from the Daily Star, again, they seem to um, really have it in for you, is... Um, Matt Letizia claims Sky Sports sacking was down to being a middle-aged white man. And um, do, you, do you think that that is reflective of how you actually feel? Um, I think the, the quote that I actually said was, um, I, when asked about the show, Soccer Saturday specifically, uh, I said, I don't think having five middle-aged white men for six hours on a Saturday afternoon was a particularly good look for sky when they're trying to promote diversity mm. uh, that's what i said so that's obviously what they what they've, they've sensationalized they've it to a certain extent twisted that around a little bit and actually um uh, i think you'll find that sky themselves has said they wanted to be more diverse mm -hmm. um and we've seen that with the with the uh women more women pundits on there um and i don't i don't have a problem with uh, with any of that stuff uh I believe, and I've said this right from the start, that I think television should be representative of our society. So I think proportional representation on the television is a, is a good thing. Okay. Uh, and, and you know, uh, that's that's mm -hmm. been my stance right from the start. But obviously, you say things mm -hmm. like that, they, you know, that, that's far too sensible. Mm -hmm. You've got you to sensationalise things and twist your words to try and make you look like an idiot. Mm -hmm. I'm, I've always held the opinion that as long as they're the best person for the job, it doesn't matter. Right? And exactly right. That uh, That's obviously a, a, a point as well that gets forgotten in a lot mm -hmm. of these debates where, you know, I think if we had a society where it was a, a proper meritocracy and uh, you, you just had a system where the best person for the job gets the job irrespective of colour, creed, race, sex, whatever, um, I think society would be a much better place. I very much agree. And... Uh... On, on a topic of society not being a particularly good place, let's talk about Jamie Carragher. Um, so 
you mentioned that Sky Sports didn't uh, sack Jamie Carragher and he sp- spat at a 14-year-old girl, didn't he, from he his did. car? He did, yeah. Um, you know, he was suspended for five or six months and then, you know, just brought back in when all the furore had, uh, had died down. Mm. So, um, so yeah, uh, I, I just asked the question, if they were that worried about their reputation, what, why would they re-employ Jamie Carragher, at which point uh, they didn't wish to continue the conversation. It's um, funny that, isn't it? Yeah, it's strange. strange. It's, 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 most, it's a, a lot of the time you, you actually uh, ask difficult questions of the people on the other side of the argument. They tend to run away from the conversation and don't want to engage anymore and then just go, <clears throat> conspiracy theories, I'm not talking to you. I think it might be part of the reason why they're so hot on crushing dissenting opinions is because when it's in open debate, well, maybe they don't have... They can't stand up. Yeah. It, they, they, their arguments don't stand up to open debate. And that's why we're seeing uh, at the moment all across the world, um, the uh, governments across the world trying to um, police the internet. Uh, uh, you know, I really the, detest this sort of thing. In oh, my God. It's, it's just pure disgusting. pure information control, isn't it? It's information control. So these pe- basically these people have been spouting lies and BS for so long, and the internet has now shone a light on a lot of the corruption and a lot of the conflicts of interest in this world. And all of a sudden, the genie is kind of escaping from the bottle a little bit, and they go, oh, my God, we can't have all these people knowing what we're doing. <laughs> we can't have them knowing about our conflicts of interest with the pharmaceutical industries. Um, you know, we, we, we can't have, we've got to censor this, and we've got to employ millions of people to shut down debate on the internet and grasp people up and block their Twitter accounts. And you know, it's just it just defies belief that people still look at this and go, oh, yeah, yeah, the government are right. Let's get the online harms bill and send that through Parliament. Brilliant. I, I really despise that bill. Oh. It's her- horrifically it, dystopian. It, it is horrifically And dystopian. the fact they're posing it as being this societal good. Oh, we're protecting children whilst also, you know, and whilst removing... Also like trafficking children <laughs> at the same time. But there's another thing you just won't talk about. So I'm going to quickly mention uh, this article we have on the website. This is from a little while ago, um, written by Noel Yaxley. This is from November of 2022, um, titled Football, Qatar and Performative Activism. Um, So make sure to check that out if you're into football and how it intersects with politics. Um, What were your um, views on the whole Qatar thing? Because, of course, there were lots of people talking about how they were going to boycott, um, you know, the tournament. Yeah, because of it was the views of the Qataris, it? and then mysteriously, um, all of that disappeared when we started to do well. Yeah, no mention of it. Yeah, it was really, really strange, wasn't it? How you know, all these virtuous people uh, talking about human rights and everything, and uh, all of a sudden they're quite happy to go and take the money and uh, go and um, you know report on these games and you know present their programs from over there and. Um, you know, whilst trying to go, yes, we're going to try and change things from the inside. But yes, you don't care about that at all. Mm-hmm. So, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> Gary Lineker. Yes, uh, I'm just about to uh, mention him, in fact. Oh, excellent. And so, of course, I'm, I'm talking about the, the so-called scandal of Gary Lineker comparing the government's plan to curb migrant um, channel crossings as something akin to Nazi Germany, or using the language, I think, was the specific uh, yeah. way he put it, of Nazi Germany. And he got in trouble because, of course, the BBC that employ him, in fact, he is the highest paid um, presenter at the BBC, um, they said, you can't say this, this is controversial, this goes against our, our guidelines, so to speak. And he was temporarily suspended, but, um, of course... He was reinstated of after. Of course, he was. Many of the members of Match of the Day, um, performatively, I would say, um, boycotted the decision. Even though, you know, if you're interpreting the guidelines, he d- did do something wrong. And I'm not actually going to throw him under the bus as much as possible. I mean, I don't agree with I, what he I, said. I actually, uh, I actually said at the time, you know, Gary is entitled to freedom of speech the same way we are. That's that, exactly and, what I was going to say. Yeah. And we should all be uh, allowed to to speak our minds and, and have our opinions. Um, the, the the problem comes is when somebody like Gary says something and somebody like I say something, and the reactions are, are two mm-hmm. very different reactions. I so think, Gary gets his job back, mm-hmm. probably get a rise, uh, and, and I don't work again for 
several years. Mm. In- I think there's um, a mistaken perception around the notion of impartiality in particularly the BBC because human beings can't be impartial. Absolutely. We, we bring presuppositions to yeah. whatever we understand and that shapes how we understand it. So it's a misguided aim in the first place. I think if you wanted this sort of setup, I, I don't believe in state media. I think it, the BBC should be privatised. Yes, I agree. I, um, I, I absolutely agree. And I think, I think everybody in the BBC, um, uh, if they want to have some guidelines for when they are on air about not being biased, mm-hmm. then by all means, if they have a personal Twitter account, then they should be allowed to have whatever views they want on those. If they're guy, if they're working for the BBC, and they're on air, and the BBC want to impose guidelines on them, then they can impose those guidelines, and they have the choice whether they want to stick to those guidelines or not. I think it's actually better for society if it operates in a way like that as well, because Indeed. you you get to know what the the person who's meant to be this objective arbiter of news actually believes. Yeah. And if they're hiding behind this, oh, I'm just an ob- objective. Um, presenter, I don't really have opinions that shape things. Well, you're, you're setting yourself up to be the ultimate arbiter of truth, yes. which is a very hubristic position to adopt in the first place, because of course, truth is a very elusive thing and no one person can truly understand it. Can that's they? exactly right. And it's one of the, the points that I've been arguing for the last few years is, you know, you're talking about um, the rise in the fact checkers. And mm-hmm. I and I tweeted something about two and a half years ago where, where I just said, who fact checks the fact checkers? So what I'm saying is, why are we, why are we outsourcing our, uh, our thinking to these people? Mm-hmm. We don't know who they are. You know, a lot of people don't know who funds the fact checkers for a start. So there's going to be an, an element of bias because if you're funded by a certain group of people, um, like the pharmaceutical industry, you're you're not going to be fact checking against your uh, your income stream, mm. uh, and this is what a lot of people don't don't understand. So um, you cannot just uh, appoint one person as the arbiter of truth, as you say. I very it's, much agree. It's, yeah. it, the truth is is not always what you think it is, um, mm-hmm. uh, and you've got to go through your life and you've got to make your own mind up. You need as much information as you possibly can. Uh, and then you as an individual make up your mind as to what you think the truth is, given the uh, evidence that's available to you. Absolutely. So um, one of the the final ones I'm going to cover is um, that you criticised Ian Wright for being completely contradictory um, for him supporting Gary Lineker. Um, I'm not sure if this is the media again generating um, fake controversy or whether that's actually something um, that you believe. Um, so this was, yeah, Ian Wright's uh, reaction um, to uh, the three of us, myself, Phil and Charlie, getting sacked at uh, at Sky um, was, uh, I, I felt in its own way, actually, Ian's um, reaction was actually a little bit racist, if I'm honest. Oh, really? Yeah, um, it was. Uh, I, I really felt like um, it was quite derogatory to white people, what he said. Um, uh, and the way that he obviously came out in support of uh, Gary was, was completely the opposite of uh, what, what, he, what he had said when, when the three of us were sacked. Um, so I just found it interesting. But, you know, I, I'd always thought Wrighty was, uh, uh, I'd always looked upon him as, I'd say, I'd say a friend. We had a, we shared an agent. You know, we met each other quite a few times. I um, uh, played golf with him, uh, and I just felt like uh, I felt disappointed um, mm. in his in the way that he reacted to our sacking at Sky. Well, that's that's a shame because you you would hope that he would have stuck up for you, right? Well, I don't expect people to stick up for me. I'm a big boy. I can stick up for myself. <laughs> but what I don't expect is uh, um, hypocrisy. No, I think that's fair enough. And uh, thank you very much for um, going through all of these stories because I feel like um, I- I've learned a lot that the media probably wouldn't have told me. Mm. So it- the it's media nice don't to have tell the- you a lot. <laughs> that's true, yeah. <laughs> but it's good to have the record corrected. 
We hope you enjoyed that segment from the podcast Loath Seaters. If you did, you can go over to our website. We can get the full podcast uncensored for free. And also, for as little as £5 a month, you can get all of our premium content. For example, the Epoch series where Bo has been talking Carl through the history of the Assyrian Empire. If you'd like to see the rest of the content that we put out, you can follow us on Twitter and getter at at underscore com. Until next time, goodbye.